We're going to be in Matthew chapter 20. You'll be finding that in your Bible. Hope you have your Bible with you. Matthew chapter 20. And I'm going to read a very, I think, a very meaningful passage where Christ is teaching his disciples lessons about what it is to be a servant and lessons about a, a, a far different form of mentality when it comes to serving than the world would have, the world in Jesus' day as well as the world in our day. So we're going to begin reading in verse 17. If you join with us by standing, if you're able to stand and... The teaching about uh, servant leaders begins in verse 20, but verse 17 is a a very relevant part of this passage. So let's follow along as I read, beginning in verse 17 of Matthew 20. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them. So you can, get, you can visualize this. Jesus, this is his last trip into Jerusalem. He's traveling uh, from um, east to west. He goes through the city of Jericho. And then he's making his way to uh, Jerusalem. And he pulls the twelve aside and he says to those twelve, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death. We covered this at great length going through the Gospel of Mark over the last couple of years before we completed that. But this is not the only time Jesus told these disciples this. He told it a number of times because it's not sinking in. And so he's telling them, this is, this is what awaits us in Jerusalem. I'll be betrayed. I'll be condemned to death. Verse 19, they... Uh, talking about the uh, priests and scribes, shall deliver him to the Gentiles, to the Romans, to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, this is uh, James and John's mother, sons of Zebedee. He said unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. I can't read this without wondering how awkward this must have been for two grown men for their mama. To come to Jesus and say, I won't, could I ask for something for my boys? You'd think they could ask for themselves. But either way, she's uh, doing what she thinks is right, I guess. Verse 22, and Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They say unto him, we are able now, she didn't just say that. They said that. We we're able. And he's talking, of course, about the sacrifice that he's about to endure for our sins on the cross. And he saith unto them, You shall indeed, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. In other words, you're, in reality, they didn't probably grasp this, but he said, You're, you're going to face a similar fate in your life. But... To sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. And when the ten heard it, these other ten disciples, other than James and John, when they heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. They were furious with these two brothers. And Jesus called them unto him. So he brings them together and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles, princes like a ruler, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. 
And they that are great exercise authority upon them. You know that's how it is in the Gentile world. Verse 26, a very strong statement, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. You see this many times in the Gospels where Jesus takes some event, some conversation, some life event and turns that, translate that into a teaching moment. They asked, she asked about the brothers. They could they sit on your right hand and left? He could have just said, no, that's silly. <laughs> but he turned it into a teaching moment. He's going to teach them. These disciples are, going to, are on the ground floor or will be on the ground floor of a movement that will impact the world. Literally impact the world, impacted our lives. So it's essential that they understood what leadership looks like in the kingdom of God. And it's completely different than what they're accustomed to. And just so we understand today, this is not just about them, it's about all of us. Because virtually all of us in this room, either now or in the future, we're going to be in some leadership capacity. Could be in our family, leading our children. It could be an older sibling. Leadership is influence. Influencing those other children in the family. It could be friends. It could be at work where you're occupied with your job. Could be in some area of ministry. Even right now while I'm standing before you, there are teachers and leaders among children in other places in this building. They're, they're leading other people. I'm just saying leadership is not just for the apostles. It's for all of us. And so I want us to look at the teaching that Jesus gives us today for our lives as well. So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. And God, we receive it today as the very word of God, not the word of men. And Lord, we want to be learners. We, as we eavesdrop on this conversation, Lord, we want to personalize it. And I pray you'd help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I've been going over this passage in recent days and preparing, I was reminded of a series of lessons, a series of messages that we went through in our church here back in 2012. The title of the series was, How Do You See Yourself? How do you see yourself? And by the way, we, we need to learn to see ourselves as God sees us. So the first lesson in the series was we... We, we see ourselves as sinners because that's what God says we are. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have disobeyed God. But then we get saved. The second lesson was we see ourselves as sons. We're children of God. We're no longer just sinners. we are been adopted. We heard about that in Sunday school this morning. We've been accepted in the beloved. We, then we said we, we also see ourselves as saints. That was also referred to in Sunday school this morning and last Sunday Morning, we see ourselves as being holy, separated saints, the, the children of God. We see ourselves in all these different ways. We see ourselves as stewards. We see ourselves as soldiers. We're in a, a spiritual battle. We see our, how do we see ourselves? And one of the lessons in that series was we see ourselves as servants. We're to see ourselves as servants of God. And so this is what this lesson is about. Jesus, we're going to teach these disciples what it means to be a leader, a servant leader in his work. And so there's lessons in this about, about leading. So G, this was the request. We don't know her name, but it was the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, who made this request for her sons. And you're they believed that Jesus was going to establish a kingdom on this earth. And by the way, he will. And she, they, she said, would it be possible, can I request that the person on your right hand and the left hand, the people that occupy these places, can I request that James and John 
be sitting there in this place of leadership. Now, the, we can assume this would be places of prominence, places of authority, places maybe even ruling. They would be places of leadership. And the reason I read verses 17 through 19 that preceded this context in verse 20 is because I believe that conversation sort of precipitated this. Jesus got the guys aside and he said, we're about to go from Jericho into Jerusalem. You could walk that easily in one day. And when we get there, before it's all said and done, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be crucified. And then I'm going to raise from the dead. They understood that something major is on the horizon. And all through this uh, three and a half years that Jesus has spent with these disciples, they know, that he, they know he's the Messiah. They understand that he's the chosen deliverer. They understand that he's the promised Savior. They knew that. But what they did not know and could not wrap their mind around was that his kingdom was not now. His kingdom now, he said, is in the hearts of people. But his kingdom, his ruling kingdom, would not be at the present time. It'll be, a matter of fact, it's already been 2,000 years since then, and he still hasn't set up his earthly kingdom. But they were expecting that. When they were shouted Hosanna to the king, when he entered into Jerusalem, they were announcing, this is the king. They knew that was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So they knew all these things, but this, they did not understand this. They did not understand the fact that he was going to go to the cross. They did not understand that there would be this interim before he set up his kingdom. Now here, as we stand here today, we rejoice. We've emphasized this in our church more than once, that one day Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this earth. He will literally reign over this world. and We're going to be a part of reigning with him. But that's future tense. And so... Before that, he had to go to the cross. He had to suffer and die for us. And then there will be this, this period of time that we live in today. Just to remind you, when these other disciples heard this in verse 24, they were enraged. They were moved with indignation because here these two guys are wanting the chief seats. These two guys are, you know, they got ahead of us in line. They're wanting this place of prominence. And so Jesus is going to teach them some things because there were other things they didn't understand. Not only did they not understand that it wasn't time for his earthly kingdom, but they didn't even understand what leadership looks like in the work of God. And that's what we're going to look at today. He said in verse 25, you understand, you know, he says in verse 25, that the princes, those who are in charge, those who have authority, of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them. They lived in Israel, but Israel at that time was under the Roman Empire. They understood this Roman leadership, and they understood the model of what Jesus was talking about in the world. By the way, you probably understand it. Wherever you live your life, in the world, those that are in charge... Those that are princes, those that are leaders, are the ones who tell everybody else what to do. And the further up you are in authority, the more people you have under you, the more you give orders. The further down the chain that you are at work, it seems like you're the one doing all the running, all the errands, all the, you know, you're the gopher. You just, these, these are the things. And he said, this is the way the world works. But notice what he said in such, such direct language in verse 26. But it shall not be so among you. We, this will not be the way you rule. Keep in mind, this mother has just requested for her sons to be in place of prominence because she wants them to be able to tell other people what to do. And so they're, they're in charge. They're the princes. They're the chiefs. And Jesus said, it shall not be so unto you. His leadership style is different, completely different than the leadership style they were seeing around them. 
And look what it says in verse, I just want to read it again, verse 26. Whosoever will be great among you, talking about the followers of Jesus, whosoever be great among you, let him be your minister. The word minister means servant. And verse 27, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Whoever is in Whoever it is, the great ones are going to be the servants. Jesus said, the more a person has responsibility and authority, the more that person needs to serve those that he's responsible for. You know, uh, that word, if you look there in verse 26, the word minister, if you were to take a concordance and look up that word minister, it tells you that it's translated from this Greek word diakonos. Sounds like deacon. That's because really what the word, that's what a deacon is. A deacon is a servant. So, so he says here, let him be. If he's great, let him be your servant. And verse 27, whosoever be chief among you, let him be your servant. That word servant there is translated from the same word. These words are synonymous. Minister, servant, they mean the exact same thing. Sometimes people said, you know, they'll call the church or come by the church and said, could I see the minister? Well, really, every one of us are ministers. Every one of us are servants. In the, in the Bible sense of the word, all of us are ministers. All of us are servants. So what is the word? If you were to look up, if you were to study this, and it would be an interesting, intriguing study for any person. If you were just to take your Bible and look at a concordance or a Bible dictionary and, and say, what are some synonyms for this diakonos? That's the, that, the Bible originally, the New Testament was given in Greek. And I don't, I don't study Greek. I don't know the Greek language, but I look up words. I want to know all that the words mean. And the word minister, the word diakonos, these are, this is how it's described. If you look it up and study it, it's called an attendant, an errand runner, a table waiter. Now, if you go to the restaurant um, and you're, they, you have a menu, if you go to a place where you just don't see it on the wall at behind the cashier, you know, you can choose Happy Meal or whatever. If you go to a real restaurant and they give you a, a menu, there's a person that's going to come ask you, you know, what would you like to drink? And hopefully you say water, maybe with lemon. Um, they're going to, uh, uh, and do you need a few minutes to decide what you want? Yeah, we do. And they come back and you say, yeah, we need more time. And if you're with us, we need more time. So uh, anyway, so, and then they're going to bring your food out to you. And they're going to come back several times and ask you, are you doing okay? Do you need anything? How's it taste? All that kind of stuff. And, and uh, then they're going to come back, see if you need dessert. I mean, they're just waiting on you. They're, they're, they're bidding. They're doing your bidding. They're waiting on you. And if you look at that scene, you would think that the person who's sitting there eating is the person who's really in charge and the person who's waiting on you is a person who's serving you. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, in my kingdom, you are the one that's running around serving people. You're the one that's ministering to people. You're not the person giving the orders. If you're in my kingdom, you're the person who is saying, can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? And they said, that's completely different than the world that we live in. And can't you see that? It is different than the world that we live in. He says, to, here's what he said, those who are in leadership are the ones who can, the farther you are in leadership, the more of a servant you need to be. The more responsibility a leader has, the more they are to serve. Now, let's just hit the pause button for just a moment. This is the only biblical model for leadership among the saints. It's the only one there is. It's not what we're accustomed to. It's not what we're, we dream of. I dream of have, having a job where all I have to do in my job is tell people what to do. Wouldn't that be a great job? 
This is very different from the way the world is. In the world's mind, the more authority you have, the more you order people to do the work. The less important you are, the more you expect to serve others. And that's what I'm confident, I'm certain. That's what James and John's mother wanted for her sons. She never would have thought, if, if you get to sit on the right hand and the left of Jesus, she never thought, you're going to, I'm going to tell you, boys, you're going to just be expected to serve all the time. They, that's not what she had in mind. But that's what Jesus had in mind for them. And that's what Jesus has in mind for us. That's why he said in such strong language, not so among you. And by the way, as I've said, this is not just the model for them. It's the model for us. This principle is for us as well. As a matter of fact, in case, just in case, one of us were to ever think, well, you know, I just don't, I don't think that's true of all disciples that we're to be servants Notice what Jesus said in verse 28. Please look at that in your Bible. Even as the Son of Man, referring to himself, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus applied this model to himself. He didn't come, he did not come to this earth. He did not become God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God incarnate. He never came, think about this, he never came to this earth, young person. He never came so that people would minister to him. He came that he might minister to others. And that is so different sometimes than the way we look at leadership and authority. He came to serve. And by the way, when it says there in verse 28... He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. The very same word that's translated, the greatest among you will be the servant. Diakonos is the same word that he used about himself. Jesus said, this is how I live my life. I'll probably say this again before I'm done, but this is not natural for people. Most people don't wake up in the morning thinking, how could I spend my day just helping everybody else? Most people think, I want people to help me. I want people to serve me. I want people to do it for me. But Jesus said, We're to, this is the way he lived. By the way, let's just look at a couple of other examples. Let's, let me mention the Apostle Paul for a moment. This is what he said about himself. The Apostle Paul, in my opinion, as far as we know, the greatest missionary, church planner, evangelist that's ever walked on this earth. This is what he said about himself. I was made a minister, that word minister, a table waiter, an errand runner. In Colossians 1, he says, I, Paul, am made a minister. said it twice. Hold your finger here in Matthew, if you would, please, and go to the Gospel of John. And we'll come back to Matthew 20. But go to John for a moment. I just want to read one verse in John chapter 12. Where this word serve is mentioned three times in a single verse. John chapter 12 and verse 26. Jesus said, if any man, I have those two words underlined, any man. Because I think those words like that, phrases are so important. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now three times we find this word serve, same, same kind of word. means to minister to people, to serve people. Really, sometimes it, it's, it's even stronger than just a table waiter. It's like a, a slave, a doulos, a bond slave. If any man serve me, if any man serve me, he should follow me. See, a li the, life, the life of following Jesus is a life of service. It's a life of serving, not ruling, but serving. The life of following Jesus is a life of serving. 
Let's go to another place in the New Testament before we go back uh, to Matthew. Go to the book of Philippians. Philippians. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, to the saints there in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2. And notice verse 3. This is what he said to these church members. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then... Such a clear, simple uh, challenge. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, think like this. And then he's going to tell us, explain what that means. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, Jesus, who was the eternal God, Deity, creator, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, not, that, not something he, that he would be, um, cause him really to distance himself from humanity, but verse 7, contrary to that verse 7, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. In being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that the instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples, the mother of Zebedee also, the children of Zebedee, James and John, the instruction he gave to them wasn't just for them. He said, I live by this model myself. This is the way I live. I didn't come to be. Served, I came to serve. And then Paul says, I made myself a minister. I'm a, I'm a servant. I want to be a servant. Matter of fact, he said in another place, I become all things to all men that I might in some, that I might save some, that I might win some. I become whatever I need to become. But then to clarify it even more, G, uh, Paul wrote to the to Philippians, you need to think like this. Put, this. put this in your mind. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. He became a slave. You need to think like that. If we don't think like that, we're thinking the wrong way. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I feel compelled just to deal with this is because I think serving the Lord is a great privilege. And in serving the Lord, we serve people. It's a great privilege. It's not something, it's not a drudgery. It's not, a, we don't look at it with disdain. Oh, you, could you do this? I mean, and we think, well, that's just beyond me. That's beneath me. No, I couldn't do that. Give me something more important to do. I'll do that. And Jesus said, you're not thinking right. You need to think like I thought. I came all the way from heaven. I made everything that is. I came, I could have charged the angels. They'd obey me completely, instantly. But he said, I came to this earth and became a man that I might serve people. He said, you need to think like that. And by the way, we need to think like that. Because Jesus said we should. This model of leadership is for all who follow Jesus. If you're, if you're thinking, man, I, and we ought, by the way, we ought to be thinking this. I want to serve the Lord with my life. We ought to all be thinking, that. what does God want me to do with my life? The first words uttered by the Apostle Paul after he was converted was, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What is, what is it you want me to do? He wasn't doing that in order to get saved. He did that because he was saved. This model of leadership. And so let's, when I think about that, if that's the way we're to live, then I, the, the logical question then is, well, where and how? How is this leadership to be 
applied. And I believe it's to be applied in every aspect of our life. In every aspect of our life, in our homes, we're to serve one another. We're to serve one another in our homes. Children are to serve one another. Husbands are to serve their wives, and wives are to serve their husbands. You say, well, I'm, I've had men kind of have that kind of a mentality many years ago, not recently, but, but you know, like, I'm, you know, my wife needs to submit. I'm in charge, whatever. And you know what? There is truth to that, but we're all to be serving one another. In the home, we're to serve each other. The more responsibility we have, according to Jesus, the more we're to serve those that we lead. You know, it shouldn't be a race between my wife and I of who has to do the most or who gets to do the least. We ought to be in it to serve each other. This is, this is how Christians are to live. Every one of us. It's the same in society. I'm not even going to go to this, but Paul wrote to the, to the Colossians that if you're a slave, if you're a slave, you're to treat your master with respect. The Bible wasn't endorsing or or commending slavery, but slavery was a part of their culture. And he said, if you're a slave, you're to do what you do to your slave from the heart as though you were serving Christ. Everywhere, that's where we're to be. We're to be his servants. We're not lords, we're not masters. We're to, we're to be his servants. In the church, we're to serve one another. Paul wrote this. To the Galatians. Think about this. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Freedom in Christ. Liberty. Only. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The church is to be filled with servants. Men and women who serve each other. Children who see their parents serving other people. That's, the, that's the, the mentality, the attitude among God's people. And you know what? If you have people in your life, and I want to say I'm very thankful that I have people in my life that throughout my Christian journey, even before I was saved, I lived in a home where I had a mother who modeled this. She was a servant in every sense of the word, a servant of others, a servant of God, serving people in the church. She was... She was a single parent, and then, and then she was a widow after my dad died. And she, she was a servant. I saw, I saw this before I ever got saved. This is what it looks like. But all through our Christian life, my wife and I have been the privilege, privilege to be in, the, in a community of people who serve the Lord. I, I'm not going to name names, but I could just name people in this building, in this church, that just live this life, they're servants. They serve the Lord. They serve the Lord with their time. They serve the Lord with their lives. They put others first. You know what? We look at people like that and say, boy, those people are, are, are real Christians. Or we say, well, that's the way all of us ought to be. That's what God is looking for. Now, this style of leadership has to be developed. Because it doesn't come natural. It's not a part of our sinful nature. It's not a part of my sinful nature. Serving other people is not a spiritual gift that all of us don't have. All of us are to be service. Now, some people may be gifted in a special way, and I think that's true. How do you develop this? How do you develop this attitude? And I want to give you three things that I think really contribute to it. The first is it takes humility. Humility. In that passage in Philippians 2 where Jesus, or where Paul is telling, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, said this about Jesus who humbled himself. I personally believe that one of the things that keeps us maybe more than any other thing from adopting this lifestyle is our own pride. It's a me first mentality. And a me first mentality will not embrace servanthood. A me first mentality says, I wanna, I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to wait on somebody else to do it. Where a servant says, you know, if I can do that, I'm going to do it. Pride is a great adversary to servant leadership. I'm not willing to do that. So first of all, we have to develop, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual characteristic of humility. Lord, I want to 
I don't want to just look at it from my point of view, what's good for me, what do I want to do? Because we, you know, it's like, it's like serving the Lord in any capacity. If, I, if a person doesn't want to serve the Lord, they're going to find all kinds of excuses not to. Because they're not really wanting to serve the Lord. Well, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I personally believe the people, if I were to mention people in our church that serve, they're, they're, they're sort of like the person that Paul mentioned in the, in the Gospels or in the, in the uh, epistles where it said that he's addicted himself to the ministry. They're just like addicted to the ministry. You say, well, they must have more time. No, not necessarily. They don't, everybody has the same amount of time. It just depends on how much we're willing to hum- say, that's not my time, that's God's time. Humility says it's not my time, it's God's time. So first of all, we have to humble ourselves. Second of all, we have to have a willingness to serve. And I, see, and I think that first is saying, seen in serving the Lord. Let's just not talk about serving people, let's talk about serving the Lord. We have a willingness to serve. You know, remember that passage I'm not going to read again in John chapter 12 where Jesus said this. Think about this. The, this great big word begins that verse. Two letters, if. If any man serve me. And you know what's, what's embedded in that if is everybody's not going to. Everybody's not, everybody's not going to be willing to. Everybody's not going to choose that life. It, it means it may not happen. But I tell you, it's a privilege to serve the Lord. I mean, I, I, I don't get to, they don't allow me, I don't get to work in the nursery. But you know what? Serving the Lord is a privilege. It's not something we try to get out of. It's something we want to do. I want to serve the Lord. Why wouldn't I want to serve the Lord? With all that the Lord has done for me, done it, isn't it reasonable? that we would want to serve the Lord. And I would say, absolutely, it's reasonable. It's unreasonable not to want to serve the Lord. And it ought to be a joyful thing. I was reading uh, this morning, or yesterday morning, in the 100th Psalm, where in that great Psalm, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his court with praise, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. You know, I didn't think about this till just now, but... I was, my mind just went back to that great narrative in the Old Testament when the queen of Sheba had heard about Solomon's kingdom and about his riches and about his wisdom and she just could not believe. She couldn't believe it. But then she came and she saw it for herself and she said the half has not been told. And this is what she said. One of the things she said about Solomon's kingdom was this. He has so many happy servants. They're just serving and they're happy about serving. You know what? That's the way it ought to be with us. Serve the Lord with gladness. We ought to have a willingness to serve. Serving others is a part of serving the Lord. You know, uh, in Matthew 25, Jesus said this. Inasmuch, he's talking about when when you visit the sick, when you visit those that are in prison. Don't remember that in Matthew chapter 25? Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. You know what? You know who you're serving when you serve others? You're really serving the Lord. You're serving the Lord. We serve the Lord by serving His people. We serve the Lord by ministering to people. So there ought to be, first of all, there has to be humility. I don't know if it's this way now, but I can can remember a day when you know, if you were, if you're, if, if children uh, come to our Christian school and and you have, then they're here all the time. It's like they never go home. They're here all day during school, and then they're here on Wednesday night, and they're here all day on Sunday, and they never go home. And so they get asked to do a lot of stuff. Like, and some of you will remember this. Uh, could you go set up the chairs over there? Could you go break down the chairs? Could you go set up the tables? And it's like they could almost sense it when you were going to ask them to do something, and all of a sudden they would all need to go to the restroom at the same time or something. <laughs> But really, if we see that what we're, if it's really serving the Lord, and it is serving the Lord, if we're doing what He wants us to do. And a person has to see that mentality. So there, first of all, there ought to be a sense of humility in our life. Who am I to say I could not do that? And then there ought to be a willingness, first of all, to serve the Lord. But serving the Lord involves serving people. 
How am I going to serve the Lord where it does not involve people? I, I can mention the people down there in the nursery this morning that are missing out on the service, they're, they're serving people, but in serving people, they're serving the Lord. The people who go to nursing homes this afternoon and visit with people and, and love those people and encourage those people, they're visiting people, but they're serving the Lord. When you're serving the Lord, it's going to involve people. People who teach, people who give out gospel tracts, people who go tell people about the Lord, people who serve as ushers and greeters, people who miss services because they're doing other things to protect us while we're in here worshiping. This is all a part of serving the Lord. And all of us should want to be servants of God. And in serving God, we serve other people. So I said there's three things I want to mention. The first one is humility. The second one is a willingness to serve. But here's the third one, and this may be the most powerful one, that helps us adopt this style of leadership, and that is we're following the example of Jesus. Go back to Matthew chapter 20, and notice what it said again in verse 28, where he says, even as the Son of Man. He said, I want you to understand this, fellas. I'm fixing to go to the cross. I'm going to die. It's going to be up to you to take this message forward. But you need to understand that whoever is going to be great among you, let him be your minister. Whoever be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as I, the Son of Man, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We can't even begin. I can't even begin to understand, to conceive of how mistreated Jesus was. Not just once or twice. His own family, his kinfolks, those in his hometown. But you know what he said? He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. I came to minister to other people. And I would think we would all agree with this. As followers of Jesus, we want to be like him, right? We want to be like him. I'm glad he wasn't like us, aren't you? Because there wouldn't be anybody left to nail him to the cross if he'd been like me. I'd have wiped them all out. The greatest picture of this, and I'm so thankful this is in the Bible, is John chapter 13, and we're not going to turn to that. But you're familiar with it. Most of you are familiar with it. It should be. Again, this is before he went to the cross. Right before in this time, John 13, 14, 15, 16, he's talking to his disciples. He's preparing them. And, this, and, he, and he does this. He just threw them all off. He, they're all in this upper room together. They don't even know what's about to take place. And he grabs a basin of water. And he begins to wash their feet. And that's so foreign to our culture. It's not a part of the way we live our life. But in that culture... There would be someone, if you went to someone's house, there would be someone there who would wash your feet. And usually it was the, the most menial of servants. I mean, you'd rather do anything than what I would. I'd rather take out the trash than wash somebody's feet. <laughs> right? I'd rather work in the garden, feed the hogs. I mean, about anything you can mention. I'd rather do that than wash feet. So all these disciples are together. Someone should take it upon themselves. Some of those people should have taken it upon themselves to say, I'm going I'm to wash everybody's feet. But who took it upon himself? Think about this. Jesus did. He washed their feet. And they reacted. You know why they reacted? Because they knew. Peter said, no way you're going to do that to me. You know why they did that? Because they knew he was above that. He shouldn't be the foot washer. Somebody else should be doing that. He's above that. In serving others, we're following the example of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said when Peter was explaining why he didn't want to, why he resisted. Jesus said, you call me Master and Lord. You call me Master and Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. I am Lord. I am Master. And then he says that if I 
your master and Lord have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. And then he said, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Any one of us that are saved ought to aspire to be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. And one of the ways that we're going to be like Jesus is if we develop a lifestyle of serving. Of not thinking about people serving us, but thinking about how we can serve others. I believe this is an overlooked, sometimes overlooked characteristic or quality that really has great impact on families, on your family, on the community, on our ministry. You know what servant leaders do? Servant leaders, servant leadership translates into ministry. The more people who are servant leaders, the more ministry you have. Helping people, reaching people, ministering to people, welcoming people. And, and every, every aspect that we can imagine. It's all, it's all because of servant leadership. It's because we believe in serving one another. We believe, we believe that God wants us to be servants. And by the way, serving, please, I hope you can understand this. Serving, when you serve others, it's not just good for others. It's good for you, isn't it? It's good for us. I, f I feel blessed that for my, almost my whole Christian life, way back 1975 forward, virtually, almost without exception, every Sunday of my life, I get to come to church thinking about how I can help people. There's never been, there's no Sundays when I come and say, I just want to sit here and let people bless me. You know why? And I'm not, I'm not saying I've been ripped off. I love it. We get to serve people. That's why we want to minister to people. And if you're sitting and listening is today, and in your life, you think about your own life, you think about your family, maybe you think about issues in your family, or you think about how you're spending your life, you ought to be asking, is it, how can I put this to practice in my life? How can I... How can I, as a servant leader, minister to more people, help more people? Because that's what we want to do. Because that's what Jesus did. We've been blessed in our church over the years to see people who, who were raised in our church, people who were children in our church, people who started serving the Lord as children in the church. Those people now still in the church serving the Lord, many of them, some of them. And they have their own children, and they're teaching their children to serve the Lord. You know what? That's the way it ought to be. That's the way, that ought to be the mentality. That ought to be the desire. That ought to be the culture is developing this attitude of servant leadership. Um, I, I want to serve others. That doesn't mean our needs aren't important. It just means we don't live... We don't go through life just thinking about what people can do for us. We go through life thinking about what can we do for others? What can, how can I minister to other people? And in some ways, for some people, this is kind of like preaching to the choir because that's really the, the lifestyle that they've accepted, the lifestyle that they've adopted. But for others, it may, this may require a little adjustment. Say, so I want to shift. I want to shift my focus from just what people can do for me, but what can I do for others? How can I minister to other people? And there are many, many ways, practical things we can do that would, that would be a fulfillment, would be a result, would be the fruit of, of what Jesus said when he said, this is how it is in the world, but this is not how it's going to be among my people. We live a different life. We live, a different, we live in a different way. We're not just here to be served. We're here to serve. 
and to help other people. And you know what? That, that just blesses us. You cannot genuinely help other people with the right attitude and not be blessed yourself. I just know it. It's the way it works. Amen? It's the way it works. Now, lest someone misunderstand, I don't think anybody could get this, draw this conclusion. We're not talking about doing stuff in order to earn favor with God. We're not talking about, we heard about that in Sunday school this morning. We're not talking about doing service in order for God to give you space. No, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about serving the Lord because we belong to Him. Because we're following His example. And if you're here today and you're not saved, and I'm sure that probably applies to some people here. If you've never been born again, you've never been saved, you're not going to get saved by doing anything good of yourself. You're going to get saved because of what Jesus did for you and for me and for all sinners. We come to him in repentance. We come to him in faith. We come to him trusting him completely. And that's how you get saved. If you're not saved today, that's what's standing between you and eternal life. You must be born again. You must be born again. And it's because he gave his life for you. Because he gave his life for you. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. With our heads bowed this morning and our eyes closed. I had, before I was saved, I had such a a warped view of God. I felt like that God, if I were to give my life to Him, God would just he'd make my life miserable and I'd never do anything fun anymore. You know, I, that's just how I felt. That's how I thought. I was so messed up. I was so wrong. But you know what God does? God, as we heard this morning in Sunday school, He blesses us. He daily loads us with benefits. This is the best life there is. The thief cometh but for to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I'm coming that they might have life and have it more abundant. God pours out his blessings on us. That's the way God is. He's, a, he's, ben, he's benevolent. He's loving. He's caring. He's nurturing. He loves us. And he's not selfish. He's not selfish with his grace. He's not selfish with his mercy. He's not selfish with his joy. He's not selfish with his purpose. He's giving and generous, and he blesses us. And you know what? God wants us to take the blessings that we've enjoyed and be a blessing to others, serve others, minister to others. And I just want to challenge you this morning as we wrap this up. You, I just want to challenge you to ask yourself, is there something about this lifestyle that I really need to address, to work on? This idea that in my home, I'm going to be a servant, not a doormat, but a servant of people. Where I work, in the church, in my life. I want to serve those who are around me. I want to help those that are around me. Father, as we pray today, we thank you for the gospels and the epistles, the word of God. We thank you for this conversation that we can eavesdrop on, that we can learn from. God, it just, it reminds us of our own humanity, our own human nature. How this mother wanted her sons to be in this place of importance and prominence. God, thank you for clarifying that, for teaching us. For showing us and giving us the example. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the example of a servant that we could follow that we could be influenced by, that we could mimic 